Okay, welcome back. How many of you um, were here at the conference all day long? Raise your hand. Yeah. All right. How many of you have just shown up for the keynote? One in the back, two in the back. All right. <laughs> welcome to the California College of the Arts. Um, if you were here at the welcome earlier, I introduced myself then. I'll do it briefly again now. My name is Matt Sillity, and I chair CCA's graduate comics program, um, which is playing host to this year's uh, 2017 Queers in Comics Conference. Um, one uh, special thank you that I didn't give out this morning that I want to give out now, because you may have met my wife today if you were in the bookstore. Um, Anuja was working with Ted all day long, and she's outside at the keynote table right now, so if we could give her a little cheer that maybe she can even hear, that would be fantastic. <laughs> that was perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, a couple quick notes before we turn this over to our, all of our very special guests tonight. Um, number one, um, Tammy Ray Carlin, our provost here at CCA, had to go home with a sick child today and wanted me to send along uh, her welcome to everyone. Um, she's been so pivotal in making sure this all happens for us, and uh, she just wanted to say hi and was sad that she couldn't be here tonight. Um, I've been putting energy into this project for a long time with Justin and Jen and today, and I just want to say, as opposed to some other projects I've been involved in, <laughs> Every ounce of energy I've put into this one, it's mul it just every time, it's multiplied back by everyone who's in this room. I could sense it all day. It makes all of it worth it. So thank you so much for coming out for day one of the conference. <laughs> and before Jen Camper comes back up to start uh, tonight's festivities, I'd like to welcome to the stage our Dean of Humanities and Sciences, uh, Juvenal Acosta, who um, has been so generous with resources and um, input and support for this project, and uh, he'd like to express a welcome to everyone. So Juvenal, come on up. Thank you, Matt. Um, I just want to say on behalf of the administration and my division that we're really, really thrilled and honored that you are here to share this wonderful work that you do. Um, I, I want to tell you that, uh, believe it or not, this whole thing started about 10 years ago with a class on the graphic novel. And it took the talent, the intuition, the initiative of Matt Sillady and, of course, his faculty to turn that class into the MFA in comics. And now, you know, I think of this as, as a crowning jewel for, for that achievement. Um, we're really, really thrilled that, um, you know, I saw the, the, all the amazing uh, books and magazines that you have out there, and this is just an amazing thing that you came to San Francisco. CCA uh, takes a lot of pride in thinking of itself as a place for social justice and for change and even for resistance, and I think that this is one of those examples that resistance can have many, many different ways of expressing itself, and I, you know, I, I couldn't think of something more per pertinent and relevant in this moment in, in you know, in, in culture and in politics. So, thank you very much, and welcome to CCA. Thank you, Juvenal. I, um, ten years ago, Juvenal hired me, so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, so, um, without any further ado, let's bring up Jen Camper and get things underway tonight. Here we go. What a great day. Are you guys as wired as I am? Or? <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm really excited about this event, and tonight we're going to have uh, an incredible uh, cartoonist sharing her work with us. Um, but I first want to introduce somebody who's very important to me and to this conference. Andre Carrington's uh, a scholar and a gentleman. He, his research focuses on the cultural politics of race, gender, and genre in the 20th century black and American literature and the arts. He's an assistant professor of English at Drexel University in Philadelphia, and he teaches courses in African American literature, comics and graphics novels, LGBT literature and culture, global black literature, and literary theater, theater, theory. <laughs> um, his amazing book is uh, called Speculative Blackness, The Future of Race in Science Fiction. 
And I urge you all, even though it's kind of heavy lifting for cartoonists, um, he discusses race, identity, and power in the 20th century science fiction fandom con comics and television. Andre is, was also the co-coordinator of the 2015 Queers and Comics Conference in New York City. He was so wonderful to work with, and I told him this earlier, that all the time I was organizing this, he, his voice was in my head. And there were many times when I would stop and say, oh, but we're not going to have enough money, or we aren't going to do this. He goes, it doesn't matter. As long as we create this moment, that's all that matters. And we've created a moment, and it's thanks to Andre. So. <laughs> Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Justin, and thank you, Matt, and yeah, thank you, CCA, um, and thank you, Mariko. But wait, let me not thank you yet. I'll thank you later. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Mariko Tamaki. Um, I met the author briefly in 2015 during the first Queers and Comics Conference in New York through the Center for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer Studies. I've been an attentive follower of her work ever since, and that's why I'm here. I've gotten to know a little bit about Mariko from reading her work, and that's why I'm here. I get invited to a lot of places because I read, so I read a lot of things. <clears throat> I read Mariko and Jillian Tamaki's comics, Skim and This One Summer, and I want to share a little of what I've learned from the experience to give you a sense of what you're in for before you hear the genuine article. Uh, there are stories about being young, and there are stories about growing up. Um, you can call these coming-of-age stories, but I think that Skim and This One Summer and Saving Montgomery's Soul are not just stories about growing up. They're really stories about being young as the person you are when you're young. They're stories about being different from your peers, but there are also stories about being like some of your peers and not like others. There are stories about Asian Canadian youth at school and on summer vacation, stories about students and teachers and each other's parents and grandparents, biological parents and adoptive parents, siblings and near siblings. Skim, the protagonist of that title, dresses in all black and she's a witch. So is her best friend, but they don't always get along. Rose and Wendy in this one summer are friends, but they don't always get along either. Sometimes young people don't understand each other, and that's what being best friends is like. You need someone to not understand you really well. <laughs> there are moments when the characters in this one summer notice that their bodies and the bodies of people around them are changing, and they joke about it because that's what you do when you're young. They recognize the tendency that young women acquire to be overly apologetic, uh, reticence to being earnest, and something that I notice as a fear of being taken seriously, or a sense that there's a vulnerability that comes with the desire to be taken seriously, especially when you're a girl. Uh, Wendy voices this in her constant refrains in this one summer of kidding, just kidding. They watch scary movies and eat Twizzlers and drink pop and get wired and gossip about the sexual escapades of older kids. And while this is a story about them growing up and realizing what's coming, it's also a story about being young before you grow up. Although you see and you read about pregnancy and drinking and insensitive in-laws, you don't get the sense that these are children waiting to become something else. You can't really talk about these graphic novels without appreciating Jillian Tamaki's artwork, and I hope we're going to hear some encouraging things about the collaborative process. But in the interest of getting onto the main event, I'm going to talk about uh, what you can learn from Skim and Montgomery Soul, these people whom Mariko Tamaki has introduced to us through her writing. When I close my eyes and think about these stories, it's not just the visuals that make me feel like I went to school with Marty and Skim, with Naoki and with Thomas and with Reverend White's son Kenneth, although I might wish I hadn't gone to school with people like them. But I can appreciate the dare to be different gestures that these characters make on the page, whether I can see them or not. Reading stories like this as an adult and a teacher makes me grateful that some of the young people I teach will show up in my classes having read about people like themselves, kids who are watching horror movies and reading comics without worrying about growing up. 
young people who are smart and precocious, or average and happy, or queer and queer adjacent, because that makes them ready for the world as it actually is, full of people who peaked in high school, ruled by people who you were right about when you thought they weren't all that bright, who were motivated by their own insecurity when they made fun of you. It might not get better, but you can learn a lot about how to cope and deal with the world the way it is by paying attention to how it looks from the point of someone who is five feet high at best. As a scholar and a teacher, I'm grateful that I can show college students what they're missing when they try too hard to declare a major and prepare for a career. One of my agendas is to turn all the kids into English majors, but I also want to teach literature students and design students and architecture students and future engineers and bankers and lawyers to read, and I want to teach them to read comics. I want them to learn from reading because, as James Baldwin said, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. <laughs> in addition to the graphic novels that have won her Prince Honor and Caldecott Honor Awards along with Jillian Tamaki and earned her the distinction of being the most banned writer in the United States. <laughs> in addition to all that, Mariko Tamaki's works include Emiko Superstar and You Set Me on Fire, plus installments of Lumberjanes, Adventure Time, Hulk, Supergirl, and Secret Loves of Geek Girls. But wait, there's more. Mariko Tamaki, everyone. I just bought these boots. <laughs> so that tells you something about me. Um, so I feel like the, the best thing about working in comics and writing young adult novels is like the, the pressure to be like distinguished is so low uh, <laughs> that allows you, allows you to do stuff like this. So first, I, I really want to thank Justin and Jennifer for having me here. I, and give them all a hand because it's super amazing that they put this conference together. They're some of my favorite gays. Um, actually, like I'm actually really honored to be here, s standing in front of like a lot of gays that I'm really impressed with. Uh, so, it's, and I didn't think you guys would all be here. I thought it would be like me and eight lesbians. I didn't know you guys were gonna come. <laughs> so I'm a bit like, oh shit. Um, so yes. So I, um, what I'm the speech I'm going to give you today, because everyone loves when people talk about a speech before they give it. So this is kind of my, uh, my version. I've been on a lot of diversity panels. I was just saying to Jennifer, like, this is the only diversity panel that I would ever want to be on, because I feel like a diversity panel at a queer conference is really going to get at what diversity is. Um, I'm often like in the United Benetton Colors you know, panel at comic conventions, where we all take turns talking about what it's like to be our respective colors. Um, <laughs> But I, and then really the problem with these panels is they don't really get it all at, you know, like when people ask you like, what does it mean to be a diverse writer? It's such a stupid question because <laughs> it's like, well, I'm me. So it's like I get up in the morning. I don't know. Like, I'm not sure what you're looking for. Um, but really to talk about being a diverse writer is to talk about, you know, your story from the beginning and how you became a writer. So this is like the ultimate diversity panel. Um, and it's only about me. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my plan. Uh, so we're just going to start here <laughs> at the very, very beginning. So my name is Mariko Tamaki. I'm a writer of comics and young adult novels. Uh, and I'm here to talk about about myself in some way that contributes to a larger meaningful picture. And so I'm starting at the very beginning of me very beginning. I'm like, like fresh, <laughs> super fresh right here. Um, I am a Tamaki. Uh, Tamakis have giant heads. That is so it's, uh, impressive, right? <laughs> huge head. Uh, so yeah, this is the origins of diversity right here. Uh, this is what diversity looks like. My dad always told me that Tamakis particularly have giant heads to make space for our giant brains. Um, this is my first step towards becoming an author of diverse books. Um, and uh, actually, I think the funny thing about this photo is that I've kind of got like an author photo <laughs> pose, um, except I have a blanket on my head. 
Uh, yes. Okay, so this is me. I am about seven years old. This is to date, and this is a great top. I know you guys have all appreciated this top, and thank you for telling me you like my top. This is my favorite outfit of all time. <laughs> no outfit will ever touch this outfit for awesomeness. It's a capelet with a blouse and a matching kilt, white wool stockings, black shoes, the best. Uh, I know, right? If I could make someone remake this outfit for me in adult size, I would wear it every day. I would move back to Toronto so I could wear it every day. That's my brother Fraser, my father, and my mom, who is my, was originally my style icon. That's my favorite hairstyle that my mom ever had. It's super 80s, and she has that flyaway, like, kind of Canadian, vaguely British uh, bow tie, pussy bow, maybe it's called now. I don't know. She will not appreciate me calling it that. Um, <laughs> So th in this picture, I'm standing in a cemetery, uh, and we are uh, standing in a cemetery because it's Mother's Day, and this is where my father's family, which is the Japanese side of my family, obviously, uh, celebrated Mother's Day. Um, and this is actually kind of an introduction, interesting introduction to talking about race, because this is basically the launching pad of my understanding of what it meant to be Japanese, of which I had almost none as a kid. Uh, if you had asked me when I was little if I was Japanese, it would have taken me a while to answer. I think I would have said I was probably Japanese. I really wasn't sure because no one in my family talked about it. We ate with chopsticks sometimes, uh, but we never said like cultural heritage. I actually didn't hear the phrase cultural heritage until university and realized that it could be applied to myself. So really most of what I got of what it mean to be, meant to be Japanese, came from weird things my dad would say to me from time to time. Like how my dad told me that Japanese people had plaques for graves instead of tombstones because Japanese people were very short. <laughs> so, <laughs> something in this part of my childhood, and this is uh, actually a New York Times comic that Jillian and I did together for Mother's Day. So, something in this part of my childhood clearly contributed to my ability to understand race as a cultural construct. And it was my first step in understanding something as a cultural construct is understanding that your dad makes up stuff about his race because he thinks it's funny. <laughs> and life with my dad was basically, like really my like, my like, you know, learning ground for learning how to be a writer was figuring out when my dad was joking, like figuring out joking. Um, like the time he told my brother and myself that at one point in his life, he was the backup singer for the Beach Boys. <laughs> and the way it would basically work is my dad just has this like unflappable, steely-eyed refusal to admit that he's lying, even when it's the biggest lie ever. So the Beach Boys song would come on and my brother and I would be like, is it true you used to sing for the Beach Boys? And he would be like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it's very possible that my dad's stories are what molded my desire to create entertaining fictions. Um, and yes, so that's, that's how that works. Have a funny dad. Key. So this is Tiki Tiki Tembo. Does anybody know this book? Yeah. Okay, Tiki Tiki Tembo, written by Arlene Mosel and illustrated by Blair Lent, published in 1968 by Holt McDougall. So this was my Asian book when I was a kid. This is it the Asian book that I had, and I remember it vividly. This was the big hint that I was something other than white. And I don't remember what was said, but I remember there being some ceremony to me getting this book. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, it is the story of two brothers. One is named, and so this is gonna be a thing, okay. Tiki Tiki Tembo, No Se Rembo, Cherry Berry, Richie Pitch, Perry Pembo which means the most wonderful thing in the whole world. And the other kid is named Chang, which means little or nothing. Um, and I just want to take a moment to appreciate the beating one sibling gets in every book where there's more than one kid. Uh, I'm the oldest kid, so I don't know what that's like personally, but I hear it sucks. So one day, Tiki Tiki Tembo and Chang are playing by the well, and Chang falls down the well, which is fine. Tiki Tiki goes and he runs down this hill and he gets help and he says, Chang fell down the well, and they rescue Chang. And the next day, Tiki Tiki and Chang are playing and Tiki falls down the well, as kids do, because kids don't learn anything in kids' books. And this time, it takes Chang so long to say his, 
tell, say his, par his brother's name, that Tiki almost dies. Why doesn't Chang just say my brother instead of Tiki Tiki Tembo, No Say Rembo, Cherry Berry Richard Pit Perry Pembo? Not clear. <laughs> but the key part of the story is the kid with the long, weird name that people can't pronounce easily dies or almost dies. So this is a messed up story. <laughs> this is a particularly messed up story if this is your only Asian book. <laughs> I did research later and I found out that this book is basically a parable for why Chinese people have short names. Uh, so A, the Asian book that my mom gave me is about being Chinese. <laughs> uh, I am not Chinese. Uh, and B, it's a story about the perils of having a name that's too hard to say. Uh, which is a whole parable for the modern immigrant experience, I'm sure, but it's not a very positive one. The thing about this book is that of all the books that I read, it really sticks out. Like, I remember this book. I remember Tiki Tiki Tembo. Like, it's like this word that kind of like resonates in the back of my head all the time. Um, and probably it is because it was the only Asian book I had, um, or about like a book about Asian people. But to be fair, most of the books that I had were about animals because I was more animal oriented. Um, and in particular, I was obsessed with the Care Bears. They wouldn't have the, the Care Bears sing-along book. That was like my favorite book in the whole world. If I could find that book, if anyone finds that book, I will pay huge amounts of money for that book. Um, I think that there is a part of me that wanted to relate to this book uh, and that wanted this book to be important and to kind of speak directly to me, like to be uh, a mirror. Um, but it really wasn't, although I do have a little brother. And actually, the interesting side note of this is that whenever my dad would come home, we used to have to say, um, welcome greatest dad in the whole wide world. <laughs> and I think he got it from this book, which I only like just realized. <laughs> so this is Harriet the Spy, written and illustrated by Louise Fitzhugh. Pride clap for Louise Fitzhugh, you guys. Pride clap for Louise Fitzhugh. So this is a book about kind of a weird kid who lives with her parents and her nanny, and she spends most of her day breaking into various people's houses and workplaces and spying on them. This is probably the most influential book of my childhood. I immediately identified with this book, despite being neither an only child, nor a kid with a nanny, nor white. Um, it is a book about not fitting into the world, about the desire to capture a part of the world, even if it means breaking into people's houses and possibly losing friends that you write about, which I can relate to, actually. So uh, the, I related to this book so intensely that after I read it, I started um, trying to break into people's houses. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody I knew had a dumb waiter. That was the thing that I really wanted. I really wanted to be with my notebook and be like, um, but I, I couldn't hit that. So I'm actually just going to take this opportunity to apologize to the lady whose house I did break into uh, as a child so that I could um, spy on her. I know it's such a terrifying thing. Like now when I think back, I'm doing it. I think like I fully broke into this woman's house and we were like in her living room and we imagined she was a spy and she was just Portuguese. Like we imagine <laughs> that her having anything that was like not an Englishman, she was a spy. Anyway, uh, so the last part of the key element of my childhood are these. Um, I grew up in an age when you were either watching TV or not allowed to watch TV. So I spent a lot of my time as a kid outside pretending to be things, specifically a lot of time pretending to be things that I was not. Um, I am very lucky, uh, and I think a lot of my depiction of being a kid comes down to this one friend I had, this best friend I had when I was a kid, um, who, it's like, you know, like with that friend who's like perfectly happy to pretend to be like, Doberman Pinterest with you, and then she goes off with her other friends. <laughs> I was like her fox and the hound friend. Um, <laughs> but when we were younger, uh, she was the most flagrant liar I had ever met. <laughs> it was amazing. And she once told me that she owned a horse, but I could never see it. <laughs> and for weeks, I believed her. <laughs> Um, and she would come up with like all these details about the kind of horse that it was and where it was kept and why I couldn't go see it and all this stuff. And um, so yeah, fiction. That was my other introduction to fiction. Really liars is the sort of thread. Uh, and in addition to being a liar, my best friend was loved playing with these. So uh, my little ponies. So these are, these are 
old school My Little Ponies. Current My Little Ponies are super skinny, which I find really disturbing. These are like the chubby 80s My Little Ponies. Now My Little Ponies like emaciated pixie creatures. And actually, I would like to take a poll at some point to find out how many people who are writers today spent a considerable amount of time when they were kids playing with toys and putting them through these really complicated scenarios, um, and how much longer we played with toys versus other kids, like into adulthood, obviously. Um, so my friend and I would spend these days, and we would, she also kind of introduced me to like drama, because I just wanted the ponies to be like, you know, like they're going to the kitchen and they're going to school. And my friend was like, no, they're in a castle and all the food around them is dying. So all the ponies are gonna die. <laughs> I'd be like, whoa. All right, and then she and I would pull their tails out when they were starving, like famine. We would pull their little tails out and, and put them away for when they were eating well again. <laughs> So they would be like, and then sometimes like the ponies who we couldn't find their tails again, they were like punished. Anyway, super fun, you guys. Um, it was very Game of Thrones, and actually the first time I saw Game of Thrones, I was like, this is familiar. <laughs> so if you want your kid to be a writer, uh, you should just buy them a ridiculous number of My Little Ponies and shut them in the basement with Michael Jackson's thriller playing in the background. <laughs> that seems to be... A good way to do it. So now we're going to talk about some white books. So it's worth mentioning in any speech about any kind of literary life or any kind of literary achievements uh, that you may ascribe to me that I read vast amounts of crap when I was in grade school and high school. And two series stick out. The first is this one, written by Francine Pascal, which is the best writer's name of all time. Uh, and it's the story of Jessica and Elizabeth Wake Wakefield, who are twins with white blonde hair and blue eyes. So it's, it's like literally the whitest book ever about two white people who are both equally beautiful and look exactly the same. <laughs> um, and like it's, it's like the perfect parable of like hegemony and the heteronorm, you know? Um, the thing about the sort of, the thing that like you kind of like can't stop getting and when you read Sweet Valley High, which I recommend you read one, just for, you have time, uh, is uh, one of them is mean and one of them is smart. Um, and actually, it's funny because when I was working with an editor who shall remain nameless, uh, once she said, if you have two characters and they're friends, one has to be significantly smarter than the other. Um, so you should all take a moment and consider which one you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought when she told me that. I was like, why? And she was like, well, that's how it usually works in life. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, so this is literally like the YA version of Entertainment Tonight, which is another thing I watched every day of my life, every weekday of my life, from like the beginning of time until like 16 years old, I watch Entertainment Tonight every life. Mary Hart was like my, my dessert <laughs> every night. Um, so. There was just no question in my childhood that you were reading these books. There was like nothing else. This was it. And everywhere you went, like every sleepover, there was like 80 of these piled in someone's bedrooms. And really the main thing I remember, aside from the smart and mean thing, is that they had skin that had a peachy glow, which I didn't have. And I was kind of obsessed with having a peachy glow. And I'm sure one day I just asked my mom if I had a peachy glow. And I wonder if she wondered why. Um, so these books are terrible. Um, they're... <laughs> Moral lessons wrapped in cashmere, and they're incredibly popular. Uh, they're books where mean people get punished for being mean, but not in any way that lasts beyond the individual issue. Like, Jessica tries to steal a boy but, and pays the price, but pays the price is always in quotes because of privilege, um, <laughs> which, of course, they don't say. Um, but these books pale in comparison to the other obsession I had when I was a teenager. I'm sure you guys can guess. Right? Uh, Flowers in the Attic, for those of you who don't know, V.C. Andrews is a book about another white woman whose husband dies, so she takes her four kids, uh, another tw more twins, uh, back to her parents' mansion, and then she shuts them in the attic and tries to slowly kill them while her two oldest children fall in love and eventually have sex. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Um, there's just nothing messed up about this series. It's just like messed up after messed up after messed up. It's like a literary Jerry Springer. 
Uh, I will say the seeds of yesterday is not bad. Like it's slightly better for whatever reason. Uh, and that's always stuck in my head that the seeds of yesterday is better. Maybe that's not even true. It's just something I've decided to tell myself. Today, it actually, as a side note, it kills me whenever people complain about this one summer and the two girls talking about masturbation that um, my reading choice of when I was 14 was like about incest and rape and I turned out okay. Um, <laughs> on a side note, uh, in case I forget to mention this, The Hunger Games is basically a series of books about teenagers forced to murder each other and nobody cares about that, so. <laughs> food for thought. Um, yes, so that's it. That's me. That's like my entire teenage years are just soaked in melodrama and ridiculousness. And then somehow out of that I emerge at 15 um, out of terrible books and don't read terrible books anymore. I mean, mostly. Uh, I have no idea why this happened. Um, I think it's like when you eat ice cream for a week and then you don't want, you want a salad. Like that just happened. Um, so sometime around 15, 16, I began a voyage into the world of being a literary nerd. I picked my favorite Canadian writers and I read all of their books. Um, and the distinction, so you know, between a literary nerd and a regular reader is that there was actually a moment when I sat in my room as a, as a teenager and I vowed to read all of Alice Munro, Timothy Finley, and Margaret Atwood's books. Like I vowed to myself. I probably like pressed my hands up against the window, like in this vaguely religious pose. Probably Enya was playing in the background. Like it was a very <laughs> serious thing. And because I am a nerd, I fully went through with it and I only read Canadian literary greats for many years. And the good part of it, I mean the bad part of this is I lost friends, obviously I lost friends. <laughs> um, but the good part of it is that it, it was this shift from wanting to read books to becoming obsessed with actual writing, the actual act of writing. Um, and not just what happens in stories, but how writers write and how beautiful writers write and like, you know, how someone can make something heartbreaking, uh, not just by having like Jessica's boyfriend leave her, but by the way that they write a sentence. And a huge book for me was like the, one of the most moving books for me was, um, Margaret Atwood's Cat's Eye, which if you haven't read Margaret Atwood, Atwood's Cat's Eye, we can still be friends, but it's like a, it's a bit of a thing for me. Uh, so after this, you should go buy Margaret Atwood's Cat's Eye and read the first chapter. Um, it's, it's basically like Canadian YA and it's, it'll, it'll cut you. Like it's so, there's something, in Canadian YA, you mean is something you never get over. Uh, it fucking haunts you to your grave in this slow, bone-chilling way that you can never shake. It haunts your marriage, it haunts your children, it haunts everything. <laughs> it's so like, like, Canadian White kicks like Sweet Valley High's ass. It's like, you don't even know what pain is. It's so cold up here, you guys, it's, you don't even know. Uh, and the very purpose of Canadian literature seems to be to draw this like pencil line between your messed up parents, their childhood, their adulthood, your childhood, and your adulthood. That's like Canadian literature in a nutshell. Um, and it was really the first time I fell in love with the idea of creating something with writing. More than just spying and breaking into people's houses and documenting the world around me, which I did obsessively in a variety of diaries. Every year my mom would get me like the Judy Bloom diary. Uh, which is kind of like a, I don't know, it was never as spy-like as I wanted it to be, but it works. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, I was like, I'm in grade 10. That's me in grade 10. This is actually also a really good outfit <laughs> that I got from a friend who thought it was tacky. And I was like, that's not tacky, that's beautiful. I'm gonna wear that to the Dominican Republic with my parents. And what you can't see is actually was the, fir the first zits I got were on this trip, which are gloriously melted away in this photo. But it was my first time getting zits, and I tried to get rid of them by getting a sunburn on my face. <laughs> uh, right. So no problem. I was like, I'm in grade 10. I'm going to become a great Canadian writer. Like, no pressure, right? Like, just go write something like Alice Munro. Just go do that. So... Fortunately, um, I think I probably would have spent the rest of my life trying to be the great Canadian novelist if I hadn't also been queer, uh, which I discovered uh, joyously 
Well, I mean, you know, discovered. I knew. Obviously, I knew. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't say anything about it until I was like 17 years old and I was at uh, McGill University. And then, um, so the famous story of my coming out is that my friend Chris came out and the minute he was giving this long, heartfelt speech to his friends, he was just about to talk about being gay and how much it meant to him, and I stole his coming out experience. <laughs> he was like, I'm gay, and I was like, I'm gay! Oh my god! <laughs> totally stole his coming out. Uh, which, I wouldn't do that now, but I was, I was in a different place in my life. So this is Montreal, 1994. I was studying uh, English literature at McGill University. Uh, if you could go to Montreal in 1994, I highly recommend it because it was a pretty amazing time and place to be gay. Uh, and for me, it was like suddenly being gay opened up this space, uh, like literally, because there were all these amazing spaces to go and be queer and also be an artist. Um, so for those of you who were in uh, Montreal in 1994, this is like the little flyers you would find everywhere. There were lots of these amazing, yeah! Lesbians in Montreal, woot! So there was like Girls in the Sky, which was like Sky on Thursday was Girls in the Sky. And then, so all the gays, when they had their own nights, they would just like dance. And then when the lesbians had a night, they'd be like, and now here's Emily on the guitar. <laughs> and like Emily would like trot up with her guitar and like sing a song. So we had tons of open mics and stages. And people were, I mean, women were organizing these things all the time. Uh, so you would like, yeah, it was just like stage, like open mics or spoken word nights, uh, as we called them back then. And if you wanted to meet women, you pretty much had to go to these things. Like there was nothing else. It was like potlucks. But to get invited to those potlucks, you had to go to these things. Um, and it really like, so this is going to sound trite, but I'm super, super sincere about this. They gave me a completely different idea of what it meant or what it required to be an artist. Uh, because I think I thought like, well, you're like the only reason to share anything you make is if you make the great Canadian novel. And then I would go to these open mics, uh, at, you know, bars and women's centers and a woman would get up on stage with like a tattered notebook and be like, you know, I'm going to share this poem and I just wrote it on the subway on the way here. And, so this girl just broke up with me like five minutes ago and here's my poem. <laughs> and I would be like, what the fuck, are you serious? Like you just, you just broke up with this woman and you like wrote down five sentences in your notebook and you're gonna perform it? Like, I was totally, I was totally um, uh, blown away, really. Uh, and I was like that moment where you're just like, you know, oh, like, I just got broken up with. <laughs> I have a tattered notebook, <laughs> you know? Uh, so basically for most of my university life, the work that I was exposed to was stories about being queer and queer love and struggle and oppression and it was very confessional and it was incredibly personal and its power came from the past. Like the reason that people were totally devoted to these stages was because they were so personal. Um, and there were times when it was Alice Monroe good, you know, like, or Alice Monroe great. Um, and sometimes it was just like, oh, Annie broke up with Sarah again, and <laughs> here we go. And it was way more interesting to me than anything I was doing in university, because I completely was not down with the, like, it's me and 500 people sitting in an auditorium at university talking about all that jazz. I was like... I'm not sure how this is going to go. I don't understand this. Um, although I did manage to take a Russian science fiction course um, that was pretty cool. And the rest of it was just kind of, uh, I don't know. Um, so some of the arts of this event was incredibly prolific. And some of it was raw and present. Um, and really the thing that, that, you know, that I noticed was that women were making these spaces for themselves. Like women were, you know, publishing their own works and handing them out and were making spaces for women uh, to read their poetry and that was pretty amazing. So the other story I have to tell about this, come on, you knew I was going <laughs> to... Seriously? If you were surprised to see that face, <laughs> you don't know me. So the, the ones, my, one, my favorite story of my spoken word experiences was I went to this, my first like uh, Concordia Woman Center event, uh, and this woman got up with a guitar and sang uh, the song, and I was like, holy fuck, that's amazing. That's like the most beautiful song I've ever heard. I can't believe she wrote that. And my friend was like, that's Annie DeFranco. 
Like, that's both hands. <laughs> she, she didn't write that. Like, you don't know that song? Like, get it together. So then I went and listened to all of Andy DeFranco's stuff, and it's all kind of the same, actually. So, <laughs> um, But still important to our growth as artists. So the first art I made was up on these stages. Uh, I started dating people and living to tell the tale. And, um, and actually, this was a time when you could actually even court a lady with a poem, which I did several times. I was also courted with poetry and broken up with with poetry. So it was multifunctional. Uh, and it was, you know, it was, a lot of it was terrible. Like if, I, I don't have my notebooks, you can believe me or not, I don't have my notebooks of this poetry anymore, but it was bad. Like I remember even knowing at the time that it was pretty bad. Um, but it was, you know, it was the, my first go. It was my first go at expressing myself and trying to tell a personal story. Um, it was also maybe at times trying to sound like Annie DeFranco, which is a huge mistake. Uh, never try to sound like something, someone else. Um, it was also my first experience of art as something that you do in front of people, uh, and art as something that you share of yourself. And it also was my first notion of like art being something that you make for you. Um, as a side note, so this is where comics kind of slide into my life with this. Uh, so this is Hothead Python by Diane DeMassa, obviously. So this was my first uh, lesbian comic, and this was kind of like the thread that held us all together. It was like one copy of Hothead Paisan that like went amongst all of us, um, and it was like also the first time I had ever read a comic that was just about lesbians and about rage. Which you know, it's interesting because I feel like there was a lot of sadness at these spoken word things, but there wasn't a lot of rage yet. Which of course there is, rage is key. Um, so this was my first experience with this. I love it because it's kind of like like the wily coyote of lesbian comics. Um, and I, I would love one day to have like just a whole panel on um, Hothead Paisan, if we could make that happen. Uh, yeah, just make that happen. Request. Um, and, right? OK, so and then this is, I just thought I would share this. So this is like, um, so I don't often write super autobiographical things, but actually this is a comic that I managed to do with Fiona Smythe for the um, anthology that I'm now forgetting the name of. Secret Lives of Geek Girls, Secret Loves of Geek Girls. Thank you, group effort. Uh, so this is my comic about the other sort of queer thing, like the sort of fundamental queer experience in my life, which was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, the first woman I ever truly lusted for was Frankenfurter, um, which was played by this man named Paul. <laughs> um, and actually, it's funny because he saw this comic and found out that I lusted after him from reading this comic, which is always fun. <laughs> and then that's, uh, this is also the only depiction of me in a comic having sex. <laughs> So take it in. <laughs> and then me drinking, I guess, in the bottom, having a little red glass of something. OK, so no one needs to see any more of that. OK, so no, it's a great comic. And Fiona Smythe is amazing. And you should all read her work, because she's awesome. So shortly after being in Montreal for, I lived in Montreal for like four years, I moved back to Toronto, and I was introduced to the art of resistance. Um, Toronto in the sort of you know, late 90s, early 2000s was full of feminist collectives. There was this thing called Fireweed Magazine, which was this super feminist magazine that was going out of its way to publish work about politics and feminism and did a lot of sort of like specific issues about sort of, uh, they did one about body politics and they did one about race. Um, so it was a really great way to get published because that's obviously what you want to do when you're a young writer. I was also really lucky to be in Toronto at a time when there were spaces, actually this still exists, this is Buddies in Bad Times Theatre, which Toronto people will know. I think it's still one of the only queer theatres in North America that has its own space, um, which is crazy, uh, but you should go. If you're ever in Toronto, you should go. And it was a place where, you know, you could, it was kind of like a, my next step from the lesbian spoken word stages was performing at Buddies. For almost 10 years, I was a founding member and performer in the collective Pretty Porky and Pissed Off, which was a fat activist troupe that performed song and dance and spoken word for queer and straight audiences across North America, which I can say because we performed in New York once. So that's, 
that's North America. Um, so queer spaces continued to be a space to experiment, to do things that didn't always succeed, and to do things that were ephemeral and works in progress. Um, really for me, like some of the key moments that I had as a performer, well, A, that it's weird that I would have called myself a, per a performer, a dancer, um, was whenever PPPO performed for straight audiences, and we didn't do that often, but every once in a while we would do like Second City for a bunch of straight people, and it was always like a moment when they were like, what the fuck? Like they did not understand. We would be like doing baby elephant walk with like cakes and like dancing around in leotards as a bunch of fat women and all the straight people were like, like it was <laughs> terrifying. Um, but it was good because I think, you know, it was like this moment where I was like, yeah, this is my like political beating heart and you don't get the, what the fuck I'm doing. So that, that exists, right? What you do is not for everybody, that's fine. And it was also one of my first experiences working with a collective because Pretty Porky and Pissed Off was at one point like nine people and we wrote songs together. And I don't know if you've ever written a song with, with you know, eight other lesbians. <laughs> it is like, it's like, cooperation time like there really was like it was a you know to figure out like oh it's not just about my vision because anybody who goes into writing a song with eight lesbians and thinks it's about their vision is wrong <laughs> it's not um, and it was also the first time I ever got to work in theater and got to see art as something that progresses right like you, would, you write a script and then there's actors and then there's a director and there's lighting, so you're part of a whole, um, which I think is good for the writer ego. Um, okay, this is still going, right? We're still good, okay. Okay, so my work is absolutely the product of all the things in my life that were in my life before I was like writer proper. I am absolutely a writer writing into the void of books that were and weren't around when I was younger. Um, which is why the first books I published, including Skim with Jillian Tamaki, were about queer fat Asians. Surprise! Um, I'm also someone who writes from a very personal space, which is something I was empowered to do because of the spaces I grew up in as a queer artist. Uh, the first book I wrote, which is called Cover Me, is the most personal book I think I will ever write. Uh, and it's fitting that my picture's on the cover, <laughs> which I would never do again, because it basically says, like, this is an autobiography. My face is on the cover. Um, uh, I feel like there's a kind of essential stage of writing um, that is, writing starts with this story that's so close to you. That's, you know, that's like your heart on the page. It's like the first story you write. And I think that it's so crucial to really explore that space. Like to know that place, to like remember as much of that part of your life as possible. And then it's kind of like an extended rec writing exercise. You look around you, you think of all five senses, all four corners of that time of your life that changed your life. And then you write that story over and over until you get it right. Um, and I think somewhere in that act, you start finding themes, bigger things, made up of all little, the little details. And they're the subjects that haunt you as a writer for the rest of your life. Which for me is high school and growing up, the tension between what we can say and what we do say, which I feel like kind of plays into all the liars in my life, who I love, obviously. Language that's available and unavailable to us to express our experiences, what it means to be an observer and participant in the world around you, and to feel like you're outside looking in. So these themes are like my 80s music and they'll never go out of style. So, Skim. For me, Skim is kind of like an incredible experience. I had never done comics before I worked with Jillian on Skim. And in the beginning, it was really an opportunity to work in a medium that I had never worked in before and had never even really considered. I stand in front of you as a keynote speaker at a queer comics expo to say, I didn't really like comics uh, when I was younger. Because for me, it was mostly like, before Hothead, it was like Archie. And I thought Archie was dumb, because uh, I didn't understand it. I was like, he's one boy, like why are the two of them fighting over this one boy? Why don't they go and find another boy? Like, there's more than Archie. Date Moose, somebody. Right? Oh, Justin. Um, 
So the way it worked was basically, I had done all this work, like I had been working in Toronto for years as an artist and performing in theaters and doing spoken word stuff. And I had a friend who had a literary magazine that she called Kiss Machine, Emily Poweary. And one day she was just like, I'm gonna do a series of mini comics with women writers who have never worked in comics before. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna fucking do that. And she was like, do you know an illustrator? And I was like, my cousin's an illustrator. <laughs> Literally like that. It wasn't a well thought through thing. I was just like, I know an illustrator. This will be really fun. And then I called her and I was like, you're an illustrator. This will be really fun. Please do this with me. Um, it really helps, I think, to be related to somebody who's incredibly talented. <laughs> this is us at San Diego. Obviously, models of maturity. The funny thing about Skim was, I didn't know what it meant to work in comics, but I knew I knew it was like one of those things where I knew immediately what it was going to be. I was like, this is going to be a comic about this girl in high school who falls in love. Like I was just like, that's it. And I could picture, cause Skim has a cast in the beginning. And I was like, I had this picture like clear as day. Like it's about this girl who broke her arm, uh, tripping over a candelabra cause she's a witch and she has a candelabra on the floor of her room, which maybe I had, um, whatever, no big deal. And, um, <laughs> I was like, that's it, I know the story. And it was like one of the clearest, like knowing a stories that I've ever had. Um, and I wanted to tell a story that was really close to the chest, like really about a person who's falling in love and can't talk about the fact that she's falling in love. Um, and the, the sort of, we did a couple things that I didn't think about, but which ended up working really well. We set it up as a diary, um, which thematically works because it's a private space where Skim can be an incredibly frank and observant introvert, like me. Um, also kind of like Harriet the Spy, obviously. And I think early days writing comics, like having no experience writing comics, it's actually kind of helpful to have something that's like more narrative prose be the base of your story. Because it allows for a lot of room for where the illustrations are going to go. Um, boop. Really, for me, the thing about Skim is I didn't know what it was going to be. I gave Jillian this script that was this, like, basically it was, like, pages of a diary. And I wrote it in scenes, like, well, this is what's happening in the background. But I didn't give her any illustration instruction, obviously, because it's Jillian Tamaki. I'm not going to give her, I'm not going to tell her what to do. Um, and it just, like, it, it appeared, like, one day she just, like, sent it back and was, like, Here's, this is a comic. So I was as surprised as you. Like, I was like totally floored uh, by how incredible it was. And I didn't realize, like, I think I knew for theater, I knew from theater of this whole thing of showing and telling and the power of something to sort of be physically present, something that you can look at that contradicts with what you're hearing. But I didn't really have a sense of how powerful that was going to be until I saw the comic. And really the thing that it ended up playing into, which is a thing I'm such a fan of, is, not surprisingly from my background, unreliable narrators. I am a huge fan of that, you know, what we say isn't necessarily what we're thinking or feeling or what's really going on. There's always like two layers of meaning. And comics are really good at sort of separating out those two things and mashing them together at the same time. Um, I really, and especially writing about teenagers, because what the fuck do you know when you're a teenager, right? So it's really good for that, I think. Um, I love the tension in Skim and in This One Summer, and I think it really has a way of showing you how language works, like that you can see the face of a character and the context of a conversation that the language happens inside. And it really lets you do this thing, um, like, you know, when you talk about showing and not telling in storytelling, it really lets you do that. It really lets you present something um, without necessarily telling the whole story. So as a side note, I did, uh, before I was making any money as a comic book person, I thought I would be a graduate student and that would be a really great career choice. Um, which for some people it works out. It did not work out for me. But I did spend a lot of time in university studying language um, and I became really interested in this idea of performativity and the power of language to make a situation happen. Like when you say I do, then you're married. Like, like language is quite powerful like that. Um, and I like the idea of also for language to kind of create a reality. Uh, and I think comics do that really well as well. Um, also I think 
comics are the ultimate collaboration. And I really do, I mean, it's, Skim has had this history of having the sort of art and words divided and nominated separately, which some of you who know something about my life will know about. Um, and it really is a misunderstanding of the fabulousness of collaboration and the possibility for two people to tell a story together, um, which is one of the things that I really love about comics. I love working with other people and telling a story with someone else. And I think it makes the stories all that richer for, for doing that. So um, yeah, nominate them together, please. It's my request. So this one summer. So this one summer was the chance to do something slightly more complicated. I did do Amico Superstar uh, with DC Comics and Steve Rolston in between. So I got a little more how to write comic book lessons, which is I got to write an actual comic book script, which I guess I had never done properly before. And I learned I didn't know what a gutter was. So great. So I worked for DC Comics and I found out what a gutter was. I was like, what do you call that? And they were like, the gutter. What are you calling it? And I was like, the space between the panels. <laughs> Anyway, so you can, you can be an award-winning something and not completely know all the terminology. So with this one summer, we wanted to do something more complicated. And for me, it was, uh, for me and for Jillian, it was a challenge because it wasn't diary-based. So it's much more in the moment. Um, it's also much less about one person's experience and much more about many people coming together to sort of feed into one story. I think one of the things that I really love in all storytelling is I love to have like a really nice space of time where the story takes place so that you have a natural beginning and ending and you don't have to make up one. And so that's, I mean, a lot about this one summer is about time. Uh, it's also playing out my Harry the Spy theory of being a kid, which is that being a kid is like being an anthropologist of adulthood. Like that's what you're doing as a kid. You're trying to study how to be an adult. Um, which is unfortunate because usually the people you're studying are not so great. Um, and actually, so this is one of my favorite scenes in this one summer, which I feel like kind of like encapsulates the, what this one summer is about, like this kind of kids and adults together stuff. Um, and I really love the way I'm Jillian did this, like the way she uses space and the way she kind of like puts things in between characters as a way to sort of show distance between them. So this is the scene where Rose has just seen this like horrible fight that her parents have had. And I love that the voice coming out of the door, like your parents talking to the door, which is like the most intense talk you have with your parents is when they're talking to a door. Also, my favorite thing to do in comics is to have them say like little shitty things after they say something big. <laughs> Because it's such a teenager thing. Like, in, when you're a teenager, you learn like that passive aggressive, like, okay, fuck. Like, <laughs> so that's my favorite, favorite language thing. I love this panel too, because it's like, you know, like the perspective, like how small you feel when you're a kid and how small it makes the dad look too. Like, they're both kind of equally little in relation to the moon. I don't know if that's what it means. That's just my reading of it. Also recently there was this article where this woman said that it was interesting to have all these Asian people writing books where there's no Asian characters, which is, and she included this one summer, which is super funny because the dad is Hapa. Um, and if she had asked us, we certainly would have told her that that was true. Um, but yeah, research. <laughs> So really, actually, so the original title of this one summer was Awago Beach Babies, which was immediately uh, squashed by our publisher. Um, but really, it's a book about babies and how being a baby factors into the lives of people at various ages. It's a book about trying to be an adult told from the perspective of two kids. Although, I mean, to me, this one summer is really interesting because I really tried not to have any theme ideas when I started writing it. I was just like, write a story about two girls at the cottage in the summer. And it's kind of an interesting example of like how you really can't think about big stuff. Like that big stuff comes out of little stuff kind of naturally. Also, this is my favorite t-shirt. <laughs> so I think about writing from a queer place a lot. I have no real idea of what it means to write from a Japanese Canadian place because I'm just really not sure what it means to be Japanese Canadian because it really just never came up for most, so much of my life. But I feel like uh, I'm absolutely sure of what it means to write from a queer place. 
so I should sound sure now, <laughs> for everything I say from now on. Um, so I should start by saying that I, when I first discovered queer books when I was you know, late teens, early 20s, I was just totally enthralled when there were queers there. Like, I was so happy to just see lesbians. I didn't care what they were doing. Uh, and I could forgive anything if there were two women kissing, which is maybe why I like salmon berries, <laughs> which not many people, not many people, including my girlfriend, like. Um, but I think, you know, it was a great vehicle for Katie Lang. And I think you don't see a lot of people like Katie Lang in movies. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I thought it was, I thought it was good. Um, and also, I basically came out to Katie Lang's constant craving. Um, and I, one of my first signs that I was like def desperately a lesbian was that I would, could not stop listening to that song. <laughs> um, and I couldn't talk about why, but like I would be in the car with my friends and I would put my Katie Lang cassette tape in and they'd be like, fuck. I was like, it's a really good song. Um, so uh, I was so into, I was into Jeanette Winterson and basically any TV shows or movies that show queer desire and all its rejecting and twisting forms. I think every lesbian I know has paid $7 to watch a movie where a lesbian kiss and it, don't care about the rest of it. Just want to see lesbians kiss. Claire of the Moon, worst movie. But they do in fact make love, so it's worth seeing. This is a scene in Higher Learning where she's a lesbian for like five seconds, which is the reason I watched that movie. <laughs> Go Fish, The L Word, worst television show. <laughs> but okay, so the thing about The L Word, because I watched it like many times, <laughs> is that the thing about The L Word is that someone is breaking up and someone is falling in love in every episode. And that's why it's so compelling. Because you're watching something dissolve and like come to fruition in every minute of it, so that's why you have to keep watching it, because you want to know what's going to happen. Um, so I feel like when I started writing in my 20s, there was a lot of talk about bringing queerness into existence with the act of writing, um, which made sense to me as a counteraction to my entire reading experience as a young reader, where every character I read about was straight or white. I wanted as a writer to bring something that looked like my experience to the center, which is writing diversely. Um, but for me, obviously, it's kind of a weird way to fra phrase it if it's coming from like your center. It's not so diverse. So writing Skim was kind of interesting because it was so different than, like this is like the polar opposite of my bad lesbian poetry. Because it, my bad lesbian poetry was so like expressive and confessional and like me telling everything about like, you know, like, like all the details. Um, and Skim is like the exact opposite of that. Like, so I was coming from this place, like in my 20s of being like, so I'm here, I'm queer, and I'm in love with this girl. Um, but I wanted to write a book about this queer experience that I had had um, as a fat queer Asian teen. And also, I mean, for me, the experience of being a queer teenager in the 90s was really quiet. Like it wasn't, it wasn't uh, expressive. It was expressive inside the confines of my giant head, but I didn't say anything. I was just like listening to constant craving and like exploding on the inside. But outside it was like nothing, nothing. So, um, and again, the amazing part of comics is that it kind of allows you to do that. And it also kind of allows you to kind of just present queerness without, I don't know, it's an interesting picture of queerness, I think, Skim. Even like as someone who wrote it, I read it and I'm like, huh. It's an interesting choice. <laughs> um, so this is the this is probably this is actually this morning even in my what what about the children panel we talked about uh, this double page spread and skim which is obviously the reason it would probably be banned <laughs> if it was more read in the United States and I think it's interesting this panel is super interesting to me because everybody who sees this panel has a different reaction to it like homosexuals are like fucking yes like with it so excited about this panel. Um, I've also been to teachers' conventions and talked about this panel, and they are less thrilled <laughs> about this panel. And in fact, one teacher asked me if it was a dream sequence or wanted to talk with me about it as a dream sequence. And I was like, actually, many people have. And it either like super pisses me off or I think is really funny. Um, because I get to say to those people who think it's a dream, like, fuck you, this fucking happened. Like, this kiss is a real fictional kiss. It is happening. <laughs> I know, right? Um, 
I know that there are a lot of people who find the fact that Skim falls in love with her English teacher to be scandalous, and you might wonder if there's some influence there from the trash novels of my youth. And I think it's, maybe. Um, <laughs> But I think it's really more of my reflection, a reflection of my experience of being a young queer kid who was constantly falling in love with like every older woman who was like in my vicinity, like camp counselor, horseback riding instructor, <laughs> PE teacher, whatever. I was like, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm totally devoted to you. Which I think when you're a young queer closeted kid is kind of like the safe place to go because certainly you can't, you know, fall in love with any of your friends or they'll be freaked out by it. So I think it's kind of safe and also maybe they were just all super hot. Um, I think the fact that this romance actually happens between Skim and Miss Archer in this book is me pushing it into something real as a way of kind of pushing against it not existing before. Um, I will say that I have heard the lesbians who are upset that this book does not end with Skim and Miss Archer running off together. Um, and to those people I say, there's this movie. <laughs> which is on Netflix, and it's exactly that. So you can just go watch that. Uh, there are a couple things that I will not do as, um, as a queer writer. Like one of the things that came out of my, my reading of lesbian fiction, I have two rules. Um, one, I have two pet peeves which are now rules. One is I hate lesbian books where all the lesbians always end up finding girlfriends really easily and they end up having like tons of people to have sex with and it's no problem. Because I'm like, how does that happen? <laughs> Did not happen to me. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing is I refuse to write a scene ever where a person comes out of the closet and then cries. Or like confesses their love to someone and then cries. And I will say that I came out of the closet and cried. <laughs> I know many people, lesbians cry. We cry all the time. <laughs> it's like our thing. Um, but I think at the, there's this part of me that's like seen that story so many times and is so sad, so tired of like the sadness associated with that and that being a part of the queer story that I just refuse. Um, maybe one day I'll write it, but then I'll, I'll do something else really special to make that okay. Um, the other thing that I think is a lot of being a queer writer for me is kind of writing about straight people. I feel like part of being queer is knowing straight people better than they know themselves. <laughs> and I think it comes from this kind of Harry the Spy thing where you spend a lot of time watching them and how weird they are. And because you're not taken up in the moment of what's going on, you're kind of watching it and you get all these details. Um, so uh, one of my favorite scenes in Skim is this scene where Skim goes on a blind date with these two high school boys. Because when you go to an all-girls private school in Toronto, you don't know this, but when you go to dances, you have to find two boys from a uh, private school, an all-boys private school, and then go with them, because you can't just go with your friends. So I was on many of these stupid blind dates. And I've always wanted to write like a my feminist revenge version of this date. <laughs> so this is the scene where Skim <laughs> meets these two dudes. Skim's like, fuck this noise. Like, it's Skim's first, like, fuck this noise um, moment. I'm super proud of it. And then she proceeds to, like, take these boys down because they talk about how Romeo and Juliet is, like, the best book ever. And she, armed with my understanding of Romeo and Juliet, uh, proceeds to, like, take them down and say, like, you know, why the fuck is it the best book ever? It's about these two people who commit suicide. How is that the greatest romance ever written? I love... Um, obviously, as a queer person, I arm my queers with like the most insight and certainly give my queer people like the great lines, like this line in this one summer where she's like, you're sexist. <laughs> That's like the only reason to read this one summer to me, where she's like de defending, you know, women. She's for the sisterhood. Um, am I okay for time if I go for like another 10? Is that cool? Okay. Um, so I just thought I would end by talking about writing for other people. Because um, that's something I do now, is write for other people. And one of my first big jobs was writing Tomb Raider. I'll, my first job was writing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, and then I got Tomb Raider. And actually, so when I first got the offer to write Tomb Raider for Dark Horse, my first thought was that it would be super great to try to get away for Lara Croft to get a mammogram. And... <laughs> Yeah.
You were like, you should do that. Yes, so my girlfriend, Heather Gold, was like, you should do that. Um, and I was like, that would be so great, you know, to have like this like whole discussion about why a person should get a mammogram and like that, that for Laura Croft, for her boobs to be something that has to get a mammogram would be so amazing. Um, and then I started writing Laura Tomb Raider and I realized, whoops, I realized, um, holy shit, this is a super fucking complicated job. It's a complicated job to write six issues and then form that into an arc that then leads into another arc. Like, that's really hard, and writing 24 pages is also really fucking hard. Um, But then writing Tomb Raider was also the time that I realized, like, oh, I'm not writing a story about, like, teenagers in, like, Toronto. I'm writing a story about this British archaeologist. Um, I had, like, you know, I was like, I don't, I've never like been to a tomb, so I don't know (laughs) anything. And like, how does Tiki Tiki Tembo factor into writing about a woman who kills people, like shoots people with a bow and arrow? Um, And because it was, because it was my first time I was nervous, uh, which is to say that I was totally flipped out uh, for a little while about writing this, about writing a comic about a woman who goes to different countries and at various points kills people. And I was stressed up that I was going to end up writing something stereotypical at best and possibly racist. Because I'm a mas- I have a master's in women's studies. Like, I cannot write something racist. Um, and I was so stressed out about it that my girlfriend, Heather Gold, who's in the audience, uh, who is like my force of support, uh, and who I love, uh, was, was like, maybe instead of just freaking out about it on the couch and crying, you should, you know, write things, like, write things down, like, decide, like, do something about it, like, you know, write down your thoughts about it, like, write out your process, like, you know, as a lesbian, write out, write out your feelings, um, instead of just worrying about it. So I ended up writing, so this was, these were my goals. So basically I thought like, okay, I just have to think about what is it that I do, obviously in my own work anyway, and what is it that I have to sort of be mindful that I'm going to do when I write about other people. So my goal was to do, always to do research on any group of people represented so that they were specific, not just like, here's the Chinese people, and that they would appear as something close to how they would actually appear and not just like, oh, we're in China, so people are dressed like this because they look Chinese, like that's, now we must be in China because they're wearing like these hats or whatever. And to have characters speak as they would and not in an accent, Um, which is actually kind of tricky for me because I love writing phonetically, but I feel like when you're writing the other and the other speaks not proper English, there's something about that that defines them as like the other. Um, And it's not necessarily correct, but I just decided. I was like, I'm just gonna have everybody speak English the same way when they speak English. which somehow was not always as fun as I thought it would be, but anyway. And to consider context when I was using characters and how they would interact in a scene as opposed to just having them always be like, like I tried to make everybody a person whenever I could and to do research into the history that creates context. And actually, so very little of that ended up in the comics, but I'm glad that I did it because it made me, it made me think about character and it made me think about what I was doing. It was, I think, also a really great place for me to write something that I wouldn't have written otherwise. And actually, I had this really amazing moment where Joan Hilty, who's an amazing editor, gave me this really great note where she was like, you always have to think of the ticking clock. And I'm a graphic novel writer. I've never thought of a ticking clock. So this was like my first time doing that. This is actually a panel with one of my favorite Laura Croft jokes that I was able to manage to put in there. It's just a scooter joke. It's a small joke (laughs) that I was able to get into there. And actually, it was interesting because I did all this research. I did all this reading that ended up in like minuscule parts of the comic. Like you would never know that I did as much reading about China as I did. I read The Age of Ambition. Like I didn't need to, but I felt like honor bound to read The Age of Ambition to to write Tomb Raider. Um, And actually, one of the more interesting stories I read was about um, people in China who have English names that they use because English people can't pronounce their names, so they have other English names. But they have really cool English names, like Mickey and stuff like that. Like, they just create these crazy names because of themselves. Um, and I was like, that's like my modern Tiki Tiki Tembo story. <laughs> One of the things that I realized in writing comics, obviously, is that you can do research and still be wrong. And one of the things that I 
finally came to terms with was that, especially with Twitter, uh, is that I could do my best and read all these books and try to do things that weren't stereotypical, and then someone on Twitter could be like, I hate this. <laughs> I'd be like, okay. So the ideal is not to be wrong, uh, but to do your work and you know, know about the communities and situations you're writing about. But I think the goal is, is that if someone tells you that you are wrong, that you don't have to give that person shit about you being wrong. You could just listen to what they have to say, which I tried to do. Um, and in other news, my happiest thing was that after that I got to write Supergirl and just write about teenagers again, which I was super happy about. Um, and I felt like doing Tomb Raider, like my, my karmic return for that was that I got to create Dolly, who's one of my favorite lesbian creator, characters that I've ever written. And she, again, I'm like obsessed with giving people good t-shirts in my comics. <laughs> So she has the unbelievable stud proxy t-shirt, and I'm really hoping that someone goes to San Diego and wears an unbelievable stud proxy t-shirt, because that will be the best. Oh yeah, and then, is this where she calls herself a dyke? Yes, I was very happy that the word dyke, maybe not in the scene, but she calls herself a dyke, which I am very proud to have in a Supergirl comic. Um, and then this is some Hulk stuff. This is my gay character in Hulk, because I put a gay character everywhere. Um, <laughs> And he's an assistant. He's like the best assistant ever because he's gay. And he's obsessed with baking because I'm obsessed with baking. Uh, and so I also put baking videos <laughs> in my Hulk comic because I just was like, I want it to be close to me again. So I'm going to put all my favorite stuff in there. So in another little bit of news, I'm, as, uh, as mentioned before, speaking to you today as the co-creators of one of the most challenged books in American libraries and schools last year. <laughs> I know. Um, so when someone asks you who the ch most challenged person last year was, you can confidently tell them it was two Canadian cousins. So what this one summer's position on that list, which the ALA released last week, points to is one of the most crucial elements of diversity, which are the situations where diversity is painted as something that is at best not normal. Um, and I think a really good thing to read is G. Willow Wilson's post about the Marvel quote. Um, from two weeks ago, which I think is on her blog, really great. She said a lot of great things about it. I won't repeat them. Um, and at worst, inappropriate. Overwhelmingly, the books that got challenged um, were books with LGBTQ content. Of the top 10 books, the top five were all challenged for LGBTQ content. This one summer mentions the word lesbian twice. And Wendy is gay, but nobody talks about it. But maybe they just sense that she's gay and then ban the book. Um, so when this stuff happens, people always want to know what your first reaction was. I just did four interviews, and all they wanted to know was what my reaction was when I found out. Um, and my reaction was that it's kind of cool to be number one. Um, uh, and second, that it fucking sucks that books are getting pulled off the shelves because people, because there's queer people in them. And I think that fucking sucks, and you can ban that. Um, and clearly the diversity panel we need is where someone has a problem with a book with queer kids in it and then they have to face a panel of queers and explain why they want that book banned. I think that would be a really fucking great diversity panel. Um, and yeah, I think a large part of being a diverse writer for me now um, and it has to do, I think, with ending up like lists on this is like actively wanting to see things change. I don't want Tiki Tiki Tembo to be the only Asian book for kids. And I want there to be tons of queer books um, with queer kids in them that people get to read when they're little kids instead of having to wait and read like, you know, whatever it is. Like, you know, Written on the Body shouldn't be your first queer romance. <laughs> Although it's a really great book. Uh, and actually, it's great because right now I am returning to my activist roots. Uh, and trying to bring the power of personal stories I heard when I was a young queer to the books I write for young people. And my current job is that I'm writing a middle grade prose series of the amazing comic book series, The Lumberjanes for Abrams. And it's literally the most feminist lesbian thing I've ever done <laughs> is like writing this book. I actually bought a pair of like garage, like coveralls <laughs> and I wear them every day and it's like my lesbian uniform that I put on and I write the book. Uh, so yes, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome to read a book series that you fucking love anyway, but that's a pretty great job. I am proud of the stories. Our, I'm really proud of our stories and our courage to tell them. I'm super proud of everybody who's here today and who's writing queer comics, published or not. I'm super proud of you guys. 
And I hope that people are still going to open mics and talking about their new loves and their heartbreaks. I'm super excited for the next generation of stories and the queerness evolution um, and what it means to write about race and class and gender that I know you guys are all going to write. And thank you guys for having me up here. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I didn't want you to see how thick this stack of pages was, because I thought you guys would be like, oh, fuck. <laughs> it's just really big print. I remember we were talking about this, and you said, oh, I have almost nothing to say. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, thank you. Uh, it's incredible. So thank you so much for, 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 for being here and doing this. Um, so are, are you signing books now? Is that, is that a thing? OK. Yeah. So, so Mariko's going to be over here signing books. Um, and, and this, uh, right in the front, yeah? Just outside. So um, please join us. And uh, thank you for making it through the first day of Queers and Comics. We will see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>